you and welcome to our second of three panels uh, this afternoon focused on game-changing technologies. You know, really those sort of breakthrough technologies that uh, have the potential to unlock our ability to be able to respond to the challenges of climate change. Um, our topic for this session, this panel, is going to be operational resilience. And resilient operations have implications not only on adapting and maintaining a climate-ready force, a force that is prepared to meet the coming demand and scope for military operations, but also establishing a resilient homeland uh, and really looking at potential vulnerabilities to uh, infrastructure and our ability for, uh, to maintain a secure nation. So I'm thrilled to be joined on stage with our uh, excellent panel members. Um, so to my left, we have uh, Carrie Dugan, so Dr. Dugan is the director for the Biological Technologies Office at DARPA. Uh, we have Joe Corvo, who is the director for CREL, the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory. Uh, we have Molly John, who is uh, a professor uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, she's also the founder of the JAN Research Group and joint faculty at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, and last but not least, we have Leslie Hamilton, uh, who is uh, an assistant program manager here at the Applied Physics Lab, focused on the science of extreme and multifunctional materials. So uh, welcome to the panel. Uh, I am Bobby Armiger. I lead the exploratory science branch here at the Applied, Applied Physics Lab. And this covers the domains of uh, biological sciences, material science, uh, physics, and, and actually human performance and biomechanics. Um, and so uh, I'll just turn to the panel to uh, do a little bit of an intro. Um, they've prepared a few uh, opening remarks and slides before we go into questions. So Dr. Dugan, please take it away. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me here. I am very excited to, to talk with you. And so um, in order to set context for, for, for DARPA BTO, I thought I would start with the Heilmeier Catechism. So, You've heard about a few DARPA programs already today. Um, every DARPA program is born by answering a, a handful of, of seemingly simple questions. Right? There are questions like, what problem are you trying to solve? What are you trying to do? How is that done now? And what are the limitations? And importantly, you know, number three is, is written as, what's new in your approach? And why do you think it'll be successful? But that is such a loaded question. Right? So what we really want to know is what are the, the new technical insights that make now a good time to go after solving that problem? And of course, you, have, you, know, you need to know who cares, because we do uh, applied, mainly applied research. right? It's very problem-focused research. Risks, costs. Uh, time, schedule, and of course, metrics, right? How are you going to measure the, whether or not you've been successful? And so I, I set that context as I, I start to introduce BTO, the Biological Technologies Office, because everything we do is grounded in those questions. So within BTO, our goal is to develop capabilities that help the warfighter by leveraging biotechnology. So we think about our research in, in two pieces, um, one where we're focused on the warfighter and the other where we're focused on where the environment in which the warfighter works. So there are more words on this slide than I'm going to go through, but I have them up there sort of as a, a backdrop for the kinds of things we do as I talk about why I think that, um, well, or why I am very excited to be on this panel and share about BTO. So thinking about the, both the resilient force and the resilient homeland, we have a number of programs within our, our portfolio that address this. Right? So we're thinking about how do we make what we need, when we need, and where we need it, whether we're talking about food, water, or medicine. We're thinking about how do you biomanufacture things, perhaps like fuel, that are, are difficult to get. Could you do that on location? And then thinking about the, the infrastructure, right? How do we protect the infrastructure? We heard about the, the Refence program earlier today. How do we support resilient environments? And how do we provide resilience from the environment? I think that um, 
I'm trying to decide whether I tell you about one more program right now, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, so earlier today, when, when Jod Richardson was talking about you know, defeating the ice with the bat, right? So we had a, you know, we understand that that is a, a, a problem, right? So what are you trying to do? We're trying to de-ice ships. How is it done today? Apparently it's done with a bat. Um, it, it's also done with, with, with chemicals. Right? We had an insight. One of our program managers said, hey, there are lots of biological organisms that live at the interface of ice, and they survive. Right? Not only do they like, survive, they actually have adapted and they thrive. What about their biology allows them to do that? And could we leverage that to help the warfighter in these icy environments? And so those are the kinds of programs that, that we have in this climate resilience space that um, hopefully I'll get to talk more about as the panel goes on. There it is. Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Corvo from the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab. It's, it's a pleasure being here today. Uh, I feel humbled. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lab director uh, with a mission focused on the Arctic. Uh, and um, I, was, I was kind of wondering, well, I've got five minutes. So I, I, I thought I'd give you the perspective of, of a laboratory at the issue of climate change and where we are. And, and also, I, to give some insights and maybe a little bit of hope to the researchers out there waiting for the resources to come in. And you'll see what I mean when I get to my last slide. I, I want to start by saying, back in World War II, there was a need to build a, a highway up into Alaska in order to provide logistics to support uh, the war effort. And so the Corps of Engineers built, built a highway I think it was about 1,600 miles long. They built it in eight months. Wow. As you can see from the pictures, they hit this stuff called permafrost. And it's really hard to build on permafrost. And when, when you talk about climate change, you hear a lot about permafrost. Why? Well, 25% of the terrain of the northern hemisphere is permafrost. 85% uh, of the terrain of Alaska. 65% of Russia is permafrost, and it's thawing. And that has tremendous ramifications for uh, installations, operational resilience, if you will. And, um, and you have to wonder, as, as it thaws out, what does that mean for uh, greenhouse gas emissions in, into the atmosphere? What, what's interesting about this is the Corps of Engineers realized way back in the 1940s they had to look to the future, so they established a permafrost research capability. They had that foresight, and today, that's Krell. So uh, that's the origins of Krell, and I wanted you to realize that the, the sense of urgency back in World War II to do something up in the Arctic. We're going to fast forward into the Cold War now. So now we're out on the uh, Greenland ice sheet, and there's this Cold War technology demonstration, if you will, called Camp Century. It's like, can we put a base inside a glacier? And so they, they built one. And one of the things they did down in Camp Century is the Corps of Engineers pulled out an ice core that was almost a mile long. That ice core, was, that ice core and subsequent ice cores were then used to go back and look at climatic, climatic change over thousands and thousands of years. And that's where we started getting a lot of this seminal data to show that, yeah, the climate changes over time. And, and those changes are associated with the green, greenhouse gas content in the atmosphere. So what's interesting about this, during the Cold War, there were a lot of investments in, in the Arctic. And, and so this is, if you will, is um, one of the spin-offs of those investments. Now, now we come up to our current day. And there's a lot of demand signals coming in for the Arctic and for climate change. And so what I see happening now is, is that the policies are being put in place, the analyses and analytics are being done, the, uh, the war games are being performed, the requirements are being um, polished up. And, and so for those of you wondering, 
when are the resources coming? I think they're coming pretty soon because the demand signals are all right there. These strategic drivers uh, are showing, and the activities we're seeing within DOD and across uh, other federal agencies show that we are on the threshold of, of I believe, making some major technological ad advances that are going to help, help us with our Arctic uh, defense as well as climate change in general. Your turn. So I'm Molly John, um, and I'm a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, former dean of the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences there. And uh, I did a stint in government in 2009-10 at U.S. Department of Agriculture. It was while I was at USDA that I caught sight of what I thought were some potentially very significant vulnerabilities in what I now am allowed to call the U.S. food system. Uh, those vulnerabilities had to do not only with the impacts of, uh, and potential impacts of climate change on agricultural production, which is something we were already thinking about, but it's clear that those same uh, effects uh, can hit the infrastructure on which both agricultural production and the creation, manufacturing of food, and then distribution of food depends. Um, and that uh, there were a number of actually not just plausible, but potentially likely or even certain uh, impacts that we were uh, not thinking about and not ready for. In fact, uh, it wasn't even clear to me, and at that point I thought if it's not clear to me, probably not clear, where are the responsibilities for this, um, this infrastructure in the homeland, its integrity. Um, now, there are aspects of its integrity that are well in hand, but aspects of its integrity that are potentially challenged by climate change, I would, have, I would argue, um, were less in hand. In fact, since I'm here in my academic capacity, I can give you a slight lecture on risk. We did not have a taxonomy of risk in those systems. We did not have the language to talk about obvious instabilities. And we certainly didn't have the analytical approaches to um, think about how to represent that risk. So uh, I did this detour in my academic life and developed a collaboration with the actuarial profession. Learned a lot about how to uh, characterize risk and that immediately intersects with the topic of this panel because when we matured this frame to talk about risk, we also began to lay targets for mitigation, and that is to build resilience in a system that had not been designed with any of these priorities in mind and has functioned so well for so long that uh, it is a critical infrastructure in the United States that's been essentially taken for granted. COVID hit. And the fragilities of that system were uh, laid bare. The conflict in Ukraine has uh, underscored how extremely uh, interlinked and uh, dependent uh, we are in so many different ways. I happen to have picked food as a domain, or agriculture and food, as a domain, but, but it is a domain in which we can um, study some of these dynamics, um, some of the limitations, like a, not having a taxonomy of risk. Um, and then what are the approaches we might use to build resilience? Um, and there are some simple design principles, and this will be where I'll stop. Um, distributed systems are more resilient. Uh, redundant systems are more resilient. Diverse systems are more resilient. And so um, I have been very excited just in the last several years. I've been able to move to jobs where I get to think about uh, solutions, opportunities. And right here at Johns Hopkins, um, there is some really exciting work going on, some of it funded by um, DARPA and, and that, sh that builds resilience into complex systems. So the last thing I'll say is um, I had to teach myself some new skills, many new skills, 
But um, of course, being a professor, one way I do that is I started teaching a course called Systems Thinking. And um, it operated for three years, and I learned so much about um, this topic. Resilience is a systems phenomenon. It's an attribute. And uh, I would argue that I certainly was um, very, uh, I had a very rudimentary understanding of some pretty simple and powerful principles related to systems design and systems thinking. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Leslie? Yeah, see if I can get it to the next one. There we go. Um, so I'm Leslie Hamilton, and I'm honored to be here today with fellow panelists, so thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I'm a material scientist, and I've been at the lab for about 10 years. Here at the lab, I lead a team of like-minded material scientists, chemists, and engineers developing novel materials for a variety of applications shown on the screen here. Um, in all these cases, we're aiming to create new materials to enable new capabilities in and for extreme environments. Um, personally, I've always been interested in material science at the interface of other disciplines, um, especially biology. We've been developing novel materials to communicate with biological systems or mimicking biology to enhance performance. Um, so in the context of climate change and operational resilience, uh, our team is looking to identify emerging challenges and their material science solutions. So I have some challenges here on the top row and some corresponding material solutions. Things we're excited about are interested in, and challenges we're interested in include the resilient warfighter. Um, so as warfighters have to operate in extreme environments like the Arctic, which has been mentioned multiple times today, um, we need to protect their safety and their comfort. Uh, we are developing technologies such as polymer aerogel beads that can be used to create incompressible but flexible insulation, especially important um, in developing gloves or footwear. Uh, we are also interested in ruggedizing our equipment and infrastructure. So when you talk about icing of ships, we're developing anti-ice coatings or anti-fouling coatings for warmer oceans. That might be a bigger problem as well. We are very uh, interested in protecting critical resources such as water, um, and this can include moth hydrogel composites that are shown below for harvesting water from air, even in arid environments. And then a critical infrastructure, we've also mentioned a few times the importance of coral reefs, and there's a role that material science can play to encourage nature to build a more robust uh, coral reef or oyster reef and protect our shoreline infrastructure. Um, and then across all of these, we're, we're often optimizing materials. Um, even more so, we're developing novel materials. And the discovery of novel materials can be very time consuming. Uh, there's been some exciting developments in the recent years of using AI ML, which has also been mentioned multiple times, but I don't think in this context, um, to, to discover and accelerate the materials discovery pipeline. Uh, at APL, in collaboration with Johns Hopkins University, we've developed a machine learning AI framework, um, this make, learn, and predict loop to accelerate the discovery of novel materials that hopefully will be impactful um, and enable enhanced operational resistance, uh, or operational resilience. So looking forward to discussing more. Excellent. Thank you, Leslie. Um, and maybe as we transition back from uh, Leslie as the material scientist to uh, Carrie sort of looking at uh, biological technologies, you know, it strikes me that when we think about, you know, climate change and the impacts that it has, right, this is, this is on natural systems, this is on ecosystems. And so, you know, does biotechnology really hold the answer, right? Is there sort of an outsized need for innovation in biological technologies in responding to these types of threats? Um, you know, and so if so, how, and, and, and if not, what other sort of disciplines are you, are you and your organization looking to? Sure, thank you. Um, so one of the things that, that we find um, in, in the BTO portfolio is that most of our programs are, are rather multidisciplinary. And so I, I would say there's probably not biotechnology on its own, but it's, it's biotechnology um, and biology and ecology and chemistry and engineering all coming together to, to help create a, a solution. We see that in, in, in Refence. Um, 
we see that in an, another program that we have um, that begins with RE. It's called Resource. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of, of taking waste plastics, and um, upcycling was talked about earlier today, and, and upcycling that waste into something that the, the warfighter needs. Um, in this case, we're looking to convert plastic into um, oils and lubricants for weapons or, or food um, for, for nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, and so, each of those examples requires that, that multidisciplinary approach rather than focusing just on the biology. Absolutely. Thanks. Um, Joe, thank you for the introduction and, and sort of history and background of, of Krell and, and sort of your organization. Um, you know, when we think about different approaches, we were just talking about multidisciplinary approaches. You know, how has, uh, you know, the approaches and assumptions you know, from let's say the you know the 40s and 50s for building on on permafrost, uh, how has that changed or evolved, right? And as you look to the future for developing and maintaining critical infrastructure at the, at the poles, right? What new you know technology needs? What new equipment? What new approaches do, uh, do we need to be successful in doing that? Right. Well, um, earlier th this morning we heard about people forward think and look really projecting into the future and. Um, in a sense, thank goodness, way back in the 1940s, people realized we don't understand this permafrost. We, we need to make some investments. So they started to make an investments in, in permafrost and that, um, that investment started to, to, to build upon itself into uh, a, a capability where today, for example, if we go to build on permafrost, we have new technological capabilities to test the ground for, for, for uh, whether or not it's a good spot to build or not. Mm -hmm. And whether, whether or not it's a good spot, we have technology so we can build a stable, resilient infrastructure. And we're getting better and better at that over, over time. And uh, of course, it's becoming more uh, difficult now because now we have this, the, 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 the challenge of thawing uh, permafrost. And so those investments long ago have led to, when you think about uh, the, the interplay between science and technology, the scientific advancements lead to technological advancements, lead to capabilities. And so we've been watching that unfold in, in, in this, uh, from those initial investments back in the 40s. So we're in a better place today. And yet, um, today, for example, we're, we're still going to Thule Air Force Base to help them with some uh, challenges they have with their infrastructure because some of it w was built on somewhat unstable mm -hmm. uh, permafrost. So those investments are paying off today and that's the kind of investments we're talking about making now for, for the future. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, thinking about uh, new and different approaches, Molly, uh, you know, as you uh, think about our domestic infrastructure, you know, food uh, security and so forth, you know, we are experiencing hurricanes, you know, flooding, you know, natural disasters today, um, you know, what are our opportunities to build back better, right? So should we simply be focused on, you know, something, you know, gets uh, storm damage, you know, do we rebuild the same thing? What sort of opportunities do you see uh, as we think about, you know, kind of game-changing technologies and really doing things, you know, uh, build back better? Can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so. It's, it's a very exciting frontier. It's the sort of upside of the downside. Um, and in, uh, in looking at, in, through my uh, journey, um, it became really clear to me that, um, and there, there are some studies that show, doing the wrong thing is actually more dangerous than doing nothing at all. And so the hardening of today's systems um, can actually not only be costly, uh, but actively maladaptive. And so um, one of the things working with the financial risk community that I learned to do was use the tool of scenarios. Um, one of the, the challenges under the general topic of climate change is we are typically talking about what we might call compound events, mm -hmm. right? In the olden days, we would have the flood people over here and the fire people over there, and the two didn't need to intersect. And what we've begun to understand is these um, dynamics go to work together, and they create, uh, if we deal with them, crush that one, crush that one, <laughs> we, cr we end up crushing the capability to respond. And, and um, so it's really important, I think, 
to have places we can retreat back and really think about redesigning the systems we are looking at. For example, in agriculture, um, if you take the broad view, 10,000 years ago we had the bright idea of organizing and intentionally cultivating a, actually just a handful of species, like literally a handful. There are millions of species out there that are edible and many that could form the basis of our food systems, not all of which have to be grown in pens or in fields. And um, so revisiting the whole, process, the whole sort of um, proposal that underpins our food system um, offers suddenly this new frontier of ways to feed ourselves, looking at, for example, microbes where you can eat the whole body, grows in three days, um, that sort of thing. Um, it, it, it not only um, creates that redundancy, diversity, and distributed capability of meeting our needs, uh, but it potentially eases pressures that originate some of the dynamics connected to climate change. And so um, that old, uh, that famous quote, um, you know, the thinking that created the problem won't solve it, um, I see time and time again, if we reframe what the challenge is, and that's why I started out with the point about risk taxonomy, um, if we reframe what the, quote, threat is or the risk is, we often see solutions embedded in, the, in, the, in asking the right question. Mm -hmm. And the very first thing I always teach in systems thinking is the answers lie in the questions you ask. Um, and so asking about resilience, asking about how things that we have ordinarily divided up back in the day when dividing and conquering was an option, how do those things, how can we uh, re-aggregate mm -hmm. those needs and then uh, envision new approaches. And, and I think that also realizing that scale is an, a really important um, opportunity. If you have distributed and diverse, that probably means we have to move some of the most important things we as humans do to smaller scales as well as larger scales. And uh, figuring out nifty approaches to micro reactors and uh, various ways we can do what biology does, only do it without all the biology, mm -hmm. um, offer, I think, just really exciting um, ways forward. A quick follow-up. What do you feel are some of the, the rate limiters for adapting to you know, micro reactors, those types of things? Um, I think we're speaking of just almost there. Um, we're at a point where the convergence of um, High throughput ways. Well, if you think about if you think about us, we're carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, and some other important things. Uh, but really, what we need to do as species is move those atoms around at a pretty large scale, and um, in those atoms are embodied energy. Um, so, uh, I think that we are now at a point where we can revisit how some of those fundamental chemical reactions are handled. A, perfect example is uh, the, the potential to move away from the Haber-Bosch process for taking nitrogen in the air to ammonia. Very energy intensive accounts for, depending on who you talk to, one and a half to two percent of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. And that doesn't count all the consequences of putting all that active nitrogen out in the environment. Um, and uh, so, Revisiting that particular reaction um, in light of the ability to explore solution space with ML boosted AI, to do high throughput um, approaches to detection of ammonia, and uh, very exciting advances in chemical engineering and electrochemistry um, that allow us to really focus our attention on moving electrons and protons where we want them when we want them there, and not uh, fueling a lot of parasitic side reactions that themselves, in, off, in many cases, have significant negative consequences. So I think there are certain areas of focus that are quite technical, but actually we're really looking at the linchpins of what we're made of and what it is we need to do as living creatures to continue to sustain ourselves. 
Uh, maybe switching gears a, a little bit back to the, the Arctic for you, mm -hmm. Leslie. So um, yeah, we can all thank Admiral Richardson for the, 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 the vivid image of you know, walking around ships with, uh, with baseball bats. Um, so presumably, you know, cellulose and, and aluminum, right? Mm -hmm. um, what other materials, right, are, uh, are, are sort of available? Um, Dr. Dugan mentioned a few sort of uh, biotechnology approaches, uh, but, you know, what, what other solutions may be sort of emerging for some of those uh, operating extreme environments? Yeah, uh, we have a portfolio of materials to enable Arctic operations. Um, I actually heard the baseball bat story months ago and it stuck with me. Um, and we have, as a result, a number of different anti-ice coatings depending on what you need to coat and what it needs to withstand. So we have anti-ice coatings that are designed specifically to be very robust to people walking on them so you can put them on the board of a ship. Um, then we have anti-ice coatings that may be better for uh, for coding antennas or other communication devices or other sensors. Um, many of those are biomimetic, borrowing from um, the creatures that seem to survive in the Arctic just fine. Um, we also are experimenting with uh, art structural materials specifically for the Arctic. So how can we make picrete, an ice sawdust composite, more resilient to a changing temperature? So when you see um, you know, the thawing of the permafrost, can we make these structural materials uh, more robust at warmer temperatures and withstand that those temperature swings? Um, and then we also have to think about maybe the more mundane materials, uh, glues and adhesives and lubricants and even water all freeze when you don't want them to. So how can we design surface treatments or additives to enable their stability in these harsh conditions? Yeah. Uh, maybe a quick follow up and uh, hopefully not too much of a curveball, but you know, it strikes me that you know, throughout history, right, there's, uh, there are many examples of well-intentioned uh, materials or biology solutions uh, to challenges, right? So you know, asbestos was a great you know, fire-resistant material, and lead in paint was you know, really kind of you know, was, helped as a, a leveling agent, and PFAS, right, we've heard about, right, was a great firefighting foam. So, so how do we uh, ensure that the, the types of you know, solutions that we are introducing uh, don't sort of create new downstream uh, challenges? And I'll start with Leslie and sort of invite any of the other panelists. To yeah, I mean, I will, I will say we're trying to learn from our mistakes. Um, and uh, you know, I, I want to take this opportunity to mention that PFAS has been in the news a lot recently. It is an extremely robust chemical to high temperatures and harsh chemicals. It's very, very good at you know, um, maintaining non-stick cookware and acting as a firefighting foam. And that same property means that there's no natural degradation mechanism, so it lingers in the environment. It is contaminating our water um, and, and causing some health effects. Um, but we have a great team of scientists that are working to remediate PFAS by capturing, destroying, sequestering the byproducts, and then even replacing them with more um, eco-benign alternatives. So that's what I wanted to focus on as I see the replacement of these harsh and very maybe artificial chemicals um, with more biomimetic chemicals or even bio-derived chemicals that are just have a better chance of not hurting the environment after their service life. Um, so I see that in multiple fields, just people making better choices about the technology that they are putting out there. Um, and, and we just know more about what it might do at the end of its service life. Anyone else care to jump in? I would love to jump in. <laughs> so I, I think that adding on to that, one of the things that, that we consider is the ethical, legal, and societal implications of the, the emerging technologies that we're developing. And so for a, a number of our programs, we actually work with, with people who have expertise in, in ethics, you know, the, the law, and uh, you know, societal impacts to help us and challenge us to think think and broaden our perspective. So if this technology were to come to fruition, what are the, you know, the potential unintended consequences? And, and how do we design our research then so that we, we can avoid some of that? Let me hop in. Um, under the lens of systems thinking, um, there are certain precepts that um, are pretty classic. And that is to realize that any intervention has both intended and unintended consequences. And so um, a practice in that is to um, make the intervention, um, but monitor starting from time zero, 
um, both intended and unintended consequences. And one of the things that perplexes or perplex my students in that class is, I would say, see what isn't there. And they're like, how can you see what isn't there? <laughs> but actually, um, it's a very powerful way of, um, of opening up the aperture to scan for impacts you are expecting and not expecting. And um, so that practice applied early and often um, understanding any innovation um, creates a suite of impacts that vary across scales, including time. Um, and so systems thinking doesn't, uh, doesn't excuse us into the buckets we're most comfortable. It doesn't say, mm, uh, no impact in X period of time or Y geography. And um, it's a, it's a difficult thing because we it doesn't fit well necessarily with our with our buckets um, but it does reveal both opportunities for positive um, gains uh, surprising synergies as well as surprising to us as well as potential um, negative uh, impacts in both directions we may be expecting and impact and in directions we may not be expecting. And that does include, I think it's really important to realize that does include human, human systems as well. So um, we have driven really hard at highly efficient uh, systems that reduce labor. Well, there are a number of consequences for that in real life. And, um, and those are just as real as, as a, a physical phenomenon. Um, we'll open the uh, floor up for questions from the, the audience. I'll just ask one as folks come up to the microphone. Um, you know, when we think about operational resilience, sort of risk management, you know, to me there's sort of a, uh, different approaches between, you know, protecting a system, ensuring that no damage shall, you know, befall the system versus uh, building a resilient system, which, which actually may uh, you know, absorb some level of damage, uh, but the emphasis will be on rapidly regaining uh, you know, some type of operational capability. And, and I wonder if sort of that um, uh, sort of dichotomy uh, opens up different solutions, different ways of thinking about um, you know, the types of uh, you know, uh, innovations and technologies that, that everyone here is working on. Um, does, that, does that trade space sort of open up new, op new opportunities? I think it clearly does um, in the sense that, and I'll just give you a specific example that might not be what you're thinking about um, in this panel, but um, we know that biological systems are potentially um, assaulted by any number of um, baddies out there. And what we used to think we could do is make a list of those baddies and guard against them. Well, what we know now is if we can make a list and a baddies on it, chances are especially um, if there's some uh, actively dark motivation, that baddie won't be on the list. Um, it turns out there are uh, just a few pathways in human beings, for example, and we think this is the case in other organisms, where really catastrophic damage can occur very quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, so new approaches um, that go under the um, moniker of things like agent agnostic therapy um, are a way of saying we're not going to focus so much with this somewhat childish idea that we can label all the threats and then do the hardening. We're going to figure out how is it that an organism reacts and can we boost or block these, these relatively few uh, pathways either with um, familiar pharmacologics applied in different ways um, so, or, or, um, or uh, boost, the re boost a positive response or an antagonistic response to a negative response. So I think concentrating on the damage we're worried about and ways to mitigate the damage as opposed to the origin of the damage or in addition to the origin of the damage um, is really powerful. And in, 
insurance, they call that, it turns out it was a big breakthrough. Yes, modeling the hurricane's important, but what, for example, the insurance industry really cares about is the damage from the hurricane. That's a whole different kind of modeling called catastrophe modeling, and it's a very powerful set of techniques that have been really illustrative for me and my work on risk in food systems. Do you want to jump in? Or? I, I could quickly, and I'm actually going to go back to the, the, the Heilmeier catechism. Okay. Right? So if you think about the, the problem you want to solve, right, and you know, that, that you want to create a system that is either resilient or um, adaptable, um, one of the reasons we, we put out our broad agency announcements is to, to get that plethora of ideas. And so we may have an idea that we think we know how to solve the problem, but by opening up the solution space, you may, you know, like I may think that I'm going to build an impenetrable wall, mm -hmm. right? But the, the proposers come in and they say, oh, you don't need that. You could make a wall that is more adaptable and resilient. And so I think that we can, we can have it all, and I think that's one part of the, the, the DARPA model in the way we, we put out the problems that we want to solve. Yeah. Great point. Okay, sorry, yeah, thank you. Question? <clears throat> yeah, Alex again with MITRE. Um, one of the potential fallacies of understanding tipping point thresholds or planetary boundary thresholds and how you graph those into national security, if you really look at the word, what we, when we say existential threat, and serious defense leaders have said that today, is that we can geoengineer or engineer our way out of these potential predicaments. The past, if the, there may be things we will face that are not necessarily present in, the, in our history. Here's what I want to ask this panel. There's already evidence right now of unauthorized or significant geo, uh, geoengineering interventions or releases. Uh, certain atmospheric things have been occurring uh, there's evidence of, of uh, alteration of sort of next generation food supply, biological engineering of releases. Um, a lot of genies are out of a lot of bottles. There's even some evidence that our adversaries are doing oceanographic or ocean interventions at scale. And this isn't authorized or sanctioned by anybody in the U.S. government. So my question for you is, what are your thoughts on we, are there, what's the risk of dealing with uh, tipping points where we might not be able to geoengineer or engineer our way out of it? And two, are you tracking anything unclassified that we should be aware of regarding biological, atmospheric, or oceanographic engineering programs that concern you? So two big buckets. Thanks. And if you don't understand what I'm asking, I can restate it. Molly, I'm looking at you because I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I can't touch the second question. Um, but with regard um, to your first question, what immediately leaps to my mind is the power of downscaling capabilities. So that essential capabilities, the capabilities we depend on every day, are more under our control. Um, and so opening, this is the diversify and um, distribute. So when large scale or small scale interruptions occur for whatever reason, um, realizing that uh, the one, you know, there, that um, there are contingencies in today's systems that leave us very vulnerable. And so learning to live across scale better to me is an approach to the concern you're raising regardless. And so one of the things when in working with the risk community, there are risks we, we call out and we order and analyze, but we always remember there are risks that are there that we can't see. It's always formally included. And so for some of these um, larger scale concerns, there's not precedent uh, to harden, to know how to, even maybe not precedent that allows us to reliably detect an antidote for any of those threats and is certainly for compounds, compounding events um, that clearly take us places we've never been, is to make sure at very small scales we're, we're covered to the best possible ability. So, you know, a lot of focus on learning to live within the energy envelope 
given uh, to us by a particular place, space, and time. So drastically reducing the amount of energy it takes to accomplish uh, meeting our basic needs is one, is one sweeping set of approaches that stabilizes our ability to meet our needs locally uh, in the face of uncertainty. Other question here? I, I already asked a question, but can I ask another? Um, and this is largely for Professor John, but um, I'm, I think in terms of, and when I fret about resilience, I think in terms of vectors and gradients. And when I say vector, I mean, you know, we're here, there's a problem, let's draw a line to fix it. But then I worry about what I perceive as gradients, especially in the economies of scale, that tend to go in other directions. And I, I'm wondering, how, how do we get to, for example, smaller, more resilient systems when there is such a, an economic pressure to leverage economies of scales and large companies? Are, how do you get the, the economics working with the science, I guess, and, and, and align them? And, and might we have to go to a more gradient-driven approach where there's something that encourages within an economic framework, encourages that direction? So I'll just quickly say, um, and of course the last thing I am is an economist, um, although I do understand the importance of, of those dynamics, that um, our system of economic values is insanely distorted. And part of why I went to work with the financial risk community is I wanted to understand how financial rules were made because it looked to me like some of those rules were not serving us very well. And I wondered if part of the, if part of the quote, problem um, is a disconnect between the science technical world and the financial world. And I would say the answer was yes. And so a big part of my journey over the last decade has been uh, in a very sort of intensive, uh, ordered way, learning from the science technical community how to bring what it is we know into an actionable, consumable format for the community that makes rules about how capital moves. Because to the extent that money and value are better anchored to reality uh, and, and assumptions and uh, so-called externalities, which if you think about it is a very childish concept. It's like hiding your face on the couch and hoping it's not there, right? Um, we're maturing in lots of ways. And uh, those, quote, externalities um, are now difficult to ignore. And in fact, there are parts of most organizations, not all parts, where there is an incentive to be ready for the clobbers those externalities can create because we've chosen not to look at them and then there's a tipping point. Through. So I'd like to think that to the extent that the communities, the science technical communities, can connect and inform capital, we will see some of those disincentives or so-called economies of scale that are actually not, that are false, quote, economies. Um, some of those will, will um, change, and I think they already are. Thank you. Bart? Hi. Uh, there was a lot of discussion on the Arctic and resiliency where it's very cold. Uh, my question is the opposite. Uh, do you guys have any ideas or aware of any game changer technology for where it's extremely hot and adding resiliency there? I will say one thing that comes to mind is the need for available water in very arid conditions, especially when you don't have a infrastructure to support you. Um, so there's a related DARPA program and also internal work at APL developing um, atmospheric water extraction technologies. Um, so you can either, you can extract water from the atmosphere either through a condensation reaction, you know, just like a dehumidifier or this um, dehumidifier or dew drops on grass if you want to go biomimetic. 
Um, or you, there's a new next generation class of desiccants, um, one of those being metal organic frameworks that are just really, really good at sucking water out of the air, even at really low humidity. So if we could work to optimize those materials and then all the surrounding engineering to make it into a backpack or some other portable thing you could take with you to ensure the availability of water no matter where you go, I think that would be very impactful. Of course, not the only problem you'll have to solve in, in warm weather, but one of them. Is there any other question? Oh, one more. Okay. Um, hi. I just wanted to follow up on a, uh, a point from earlier about fuel being one of our biggest um, energy usage. Is there any game changing technologies to kind of address fuel consumption? I don't have an answer for fuel consumption, but I can talk about a program that uh, the Living Foundries program was started to be able to design, build, test and engineer organisms to produce molecules and materials of interest to the DOD. And so among a number of 1,635 different molecules and materials that were, were developed under this program, um, types of fuel were, were one of them. And so we're working with transition partners to, to try and push that toward the next stage of advanced development. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have just one word, ammonia. <laughs> Okay, can you elaborate further? Right? <laughs> so we're going to talk about Haber Bosch. Yeah, so um, there's a lot of interesting work um, that's uh, speaking of um, work that could potentially occur at very different scales from the extremely industrialized um, high energy input um, processes. That um, and ammonia is a very very versatile compound. It can be used directly as fuel in today's engines. Um, it, contains a lot of chemical energy. It also is a building block in many different processes, including um, a major, it plays a major role in today's food production systems. It'll pay, play a major uh, role in any kind of alternative food production system, but it's used in so many other uh, applications across materials. And so I think um, that's an example of um, where the underlying chemistry and physics and um, the ability to explore solution space we've never explored before with the intersection of empirical work and modeling, um, I think is we're really right on the cusp of some um, very exciting breakthroughs where we can synthesize ammonia under ambient conditions from air, water, and electricity um, with far more ease than we can right now. Thank you. Go ahead, I'll take a crack. I'm going to get back to, to both of the uh, recent questions about uh, resilience and fuel and the desert. So, so the Army wants to be able to uh, uh, fight and win uh, any place, any time. So they want to be able to go into any environment. And one of, one of the challenges that's, that's clearly out there is the one with uh, energy and power. So th that's common whether you're in the desert or in the Arctic. We, that's a huge challenge. A lot of potential solutions are being looked at, but we're not there yet. Uh, the same thing with, with uh, believe it or not, water and wastewater. Uh, if you're in the desert, where's the water? Same thing, if you're in the Arctic, where's the water? It's ice, right? And um, so, so there's a lot of commonality to whether you're in an extremely hot environment or extremely cold environment. You still need to have um, power and energy. You still need to have water. And we don't have the solutions yet, but we're working on it. Thank you. Great. Uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, oh, sorry, maybe last question here. I have one question, which is hopefully um, will not require a long answer. <laughs> My name is Vijay Singh. I do technology consulting uh, with Clive Consulting. And actually, my question is more towards uh, Leslie. And you showcased quite a few technologies. Um, uh, I was wondering if APL has some sort of uh, uh, process or a program to engage uh, outside smaller businesses to collaborate on, because some of those technologies may be intended for uh, you know, one purpose. For example, out here, you were showcasing for climate but may have uh, applications uh, and definitely has applications in other areas where uh, you know, entrepreneurs can take it and uh, commercialize it. So uh, 
do you, do you know any example uh, that you can showcase or uh, any process that can be used? Yeah, of course. Um, we have a lot of very smart people within the department that have a lot of crazy ideas you know, that, um, that uh, can run them down to a certain extent. But at that point, you know, after an initial prototype, that's when our jobs, jobs usually stop or at least they transition. Um, we have a great Office of Technology Transfer that we work with to protect our IP and license it. And we can, with their collaboration and their help, talk to small businesses and basically anybody in industry and explore how we might work together and collaborate. Um, we can also apply to SBIR, small business grants together. Um, and yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity to work together with multiple different entities, whether that's industry or academia. All right, yeah. thank you. I just want to provide the panel uh, an opportunity for just any last closing thoughts briefly. Yeah, thanks. Um, so just excited to uh, continue to explore the, the role that biotechnology can play in, in resilience, both for the warfighter and for the environment, the resilience within the war warfighters environment, sorry about that. Um, and if you have ideas in this space, I know Rob already you know, made, the, made the plea. Right? We're always looking for, for new ideas, and so if you, if you haven't had a chance to talk with Rob and he's, available, and he's not available, please come talk with me. Okay. Thank you, Carrie. Jeff? Yeah, I, I, I think a, a word of encouragement to uh, people starting off their careers in, in the audience. Uh, there's, you're, you're in the right place at the right time. There's, there's a tremendous need here, and I encourage you all to uh, put on your thinking caps and be innovative and creative and help to provide solutions working together. Thank you. And maybe I'll just say, um, one of, along the same lines, really, uh, it has been uh, nothing short of an absolute thrill to change fields um, th at various points throughout my career. And, um, I have learned um, that uh, it is really important to be very clear, not only about the answers, but about the questions. And um, so sometimes, uh, and I learned <laughs> a nice word for somebody who's ignorant is a cultured naive. <laughs> um, and that's what I was uh, brought in essentially by the financial community. Um, that ability to ask questions and a real focus on questions um, is incredibly powerful. And I might just mention, I was introduced as joint faculty at Oak Ridge. I'm actually not anymore, but I was for some years. And that affiliation between someone with my background and orientation and a national lab of the capability of Oak Ridge, that was a very exciting collision um, from which I gained a great deal. And, and so that just the courage to uh, reach into areas in which you don't have expertise. Um, and I never thought I'd amount to anything anyway, and that gives you a little bit of uh, latitude. <laughs> um, and so I just really recommend that, ex that the continuing to explore. Thank you. Leslie? Um, I, you know, there's a lot of big problems we discussed today, and they can be very intimidating. But um, if I haven't made it clear already, I think that with, with all of the ideas that I see, um, I'm very optimistic that you know there'll be some very impactful, game-changing technology. So I'm excited to see it through. Outstanding. Okay. Well, thank you again to this uh, distinguished and excellent panel. Okay.